Hello, heathens. I'm Megan Angus, and this is Spinning the Wheel Podcast. In this weekly audio ritual, we explore the eight seasons of the Witch's Wheel of the Year, and we discover how it is so much more than eight Sabbaths. We weirding witches time travel through holy days, festivals, and celestial events connecting our celebrations and magic to the past, present, and future. Our cackling fills the night as we take our turn gathering the wool, wielding the distaff, and spinning the wheel. Welcome to the podcast, my witches, my heathens, my pagans, my freaks. Yes, welcome. Hi, uh, it's Megan Angus, your um, fiery host. Let's be real. We have a full moon in Sagittarius this week. This is my time, okay? (laughs) But before we get into all of that, (laughs) um, how's everybody doing? How are we doing here in the last weeks, the last days of Beltane season, spring season, right? We've had, we've had a time in this season. We've had highs, we've had lows, we've had some tension, we've had some release. Um, uh, it has been a, a wild season for me. Um, there certainly has been crap. (laughs) And there's been a lot of joy too. So I'm very uh, grateful for the good times. And, you know, hopefully the good times uh, endure us, you know, or strengthen us to deal with the uh, crappy times, right? That's how that's how we how it hopefully works out for us all. Um, We've got a lot of stuff to talk about this week. Like I said, namely, first off a full moon, we'll get to all of that in, in just a second. Uh, but we do have a lot of stuff. To, I'm going to go in this week. I'm just warning you, we're going in old school, old style this week. Um, what have we got coming up? Uh, well, we have our next Wheel of the Year class is coming up uh, in just a couple weeks in June. Uh, we will be talking about Litha, which is a guide to summer solstice. We will officially be crossing the threshold in the sky. Uh, leaving spring and entering summer and entering litha season, entering cancer season. Um, but but we're not quite there yet. And we have a lot this week um, focusing us in on our Gemini energy. Um, what else have we got going on? That's pretty much it. Uh, I'll be teaching a workshop in the middle of the month. You've heard me mention this several times at the uh, music festival, Cascadian Midsummer. Very cool festival. Check it out. Um, and uh, looking forward to teaching that workshop. It's going to be great hanging out in the woods which with a bunch of weirdos talking about magic. You know, it's how we do it up here in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> um, what else do I need to mention? Oh, my books are currently closed for new clients. Unfortunately, so sorry. Um, uh, just too packed with stuff. Um, if you want to skip the line, you can join my Patreon. Uh, <laughs> that is one of the many ways that I say thank you to my patrons. My patrons make it possible for me to do this work. Um, otherwise, I'd have to have a job. <laughs> I mean, I guess this is definitely a job, but you know. <laughs> I'd be working for somebody else and not for you. (laughs) Um, But my patrons make it possible for me to do this work. Thank you so much to all of my patrons. Um, If you love this podcast and think it's super dope, uh, you can sign up to my Patreon for a measly buck as a means of supporting me and this work um, and saying thanks, throwing a dollar in the tip jar. Folks that subscribe at the Mercury level and higher, which is $5 a month and up, get all kinds of stuff. Uh, folks that, um, are subscribed at the Venus level and higher, which is $9 a month and up, get access to the workbooks for the Sabbaths, the calendars, digital spells, and all kinds of stuff. And folks that subscribe at the sun level and up 23 bucks a month and up, uh, get free readings with me throughout the year and up to even, uh, once a month with me, um, to talk about the transits, to talk about, you know, how all of this stuff uh, might be playing out in your life stuff 
aka the, the things we talk about here in the podcast. And that's all a means of me saying thank you to the folks that support me um, through that medium. Um, pretty cool. I will be reopening my books in summer. Um, and you can sign up for standalone readings. I do tarot readings. I do astrology readings and both. Um, and we can talk about it. Uh, also, I, I haven't mentioned this in a while, but um, when you sign up for astrology readings, we can do just a, a, a natal chart, uh, you know, interpretation. Like if you are learning astrology and want to book time with me to talk about astrology and continue to study it, we can do that too. But we can also look at your transits, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if all of that stuff is cool, but you're not sure if you want to commit, you can always go to my website and sign up for my very irregular newsletter. <laughs> uh, you will get a discount code that's good on anything that I'm selling through my site. Um, right off the bat. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's it. That's the show. That's the preamble. Let's move into it. Okay. So where are we? What are we doing this week? What the hell is going on? This is Beltane season, full strawberry moon in Sagittarius lunar week 10 by some lunar calendars. And that whole some lunar calendars thing we talk about throughout the year. I'm not going to get into it right now, but, uh, TLDR, Lots of people pay attention to time and track time in different ways, in case you weren't aware. <laughs> Which, if you grew up in the West, you might not be. <laughs> but here we are in these last days and weeks of Beltane season. So what are we what are we still focusing on? What are we what is our work that we are uh, you know, churning, stirring up in the cauldron during the season? Everything centers around action, fecundity, and fertility. And if you've been with me, if you've, you know, hung out on the podcast, if you've been to my classes before, you've heard me go on this little rant. But in case you're new here, when I say fertility, I don't necessarily mean flesh babies. I don't necessarily mean, mean you need to go get pregnant or you need to help another person go get pregnant and have an actual human child. I mean fertility in the sense uh, that all genders uh, can tap into this idea of gestating something, of nurturing something to fruition, um, of of helping something grow and become a thing in the world. And that can be a song. That could be a, an exceptional dish of food. That could be a social movement. That could be all kinds of things. Um, and so we are stirring up and... Um, increasing or or magnifying our fertility and our virility in this season our capacity to make stuff occur here on the physical plane that's what beltane energy and beltane season in my opinion is really all about um and that stirring up of that energy can happen in a bunch of ways it can happen in really playful ways it can happen through pranking and playing jokes and and being goofy and mischievous all the way through like rubbing our energy up against you know other people other movements other stuff the natural world and stirring up you know sensuality or even sexuality if that's appropriate for us um but it's a season of friction. It's a season of us rubbing our stuff up against other people's stuff or other stuff in the universe and seeing what sparks come out of that and seeing seeing what happens. That's really the, the core energy of Beltane season. And so we've been working on that energy for a while now. Um, and we probably have some projects going. We probably have thrown metaphorically and probably or possibly literally, we've thrown some seeds into the garden and some stuff is sprouting. Some ideas are popping off. Uh, some collaborations are forming. Some projects are showing their their heads to the sun. Um, and, and so we're fostering all of that stuff. <clears throat> okay. So that's just us grounding into our Beltane energy that we're working with at this time of year. So where are we right now? Where are we in that cycle this week? Well, we are hanging out with a full moon in Sagittarius. And we're going to get a full moon in Sagittarius every year at some point in the last four weeks of Beltane season. So at some point uh, in those last four weeks of Beltane season, in the last four weeks of spring, there is this moment where we want to consider 
our philosophical pathway through this work. We're going to look at our pathway through other lenses too, but Sagittarius really wants to talk about and think about and experience the philosophical take of whatever it is that's happening. It also wants to run around and get sweaty. It also wants to, you know, talk with people. It also wants to travel to new places and learn new things about that conversation and expand its mind and understanding of what that conversation could look like. But first and foremost, to me, as a sun in Sagittarius, stellium in Sagittarius person, uh, in my ninth house, no less, um, this moment of the full moon in Sagittarius is an opportunity for us to reflect on our philosophical process, our philosophical understanding of our life and our place in it. And it's a place where we can, in my opinion, add a little archetypal energy. We can add some mythological energy. We can mythologize uh, our process and our role that we're playing in our story. Um, and so our full moons offer us a, a culminating point, a point where we can look at the results of that work, or we can look at the effects of that work. We're not done with it, but this is sort of a to be continued kind of a moment. Like here's as far as we we might be getting on that this year. Um, and I'm not even sure if I want to say it that way, because again, ruled by Jupiter, like always optimistic and open-ended, like, but there could be more and there could be more. Um, I think a philosophical process is not linear. Um, it's spirally <laughs> and swirly curly. So, um, what, so where, blah, 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 where is all of that stuff? 8.41 PM Pacific standard time later in the day slash the next day for everybody else around the planet full strawberry moon in Sagittarius at 13 degrees. Now, when we look at the chart of this full moon, <clears throat> the only thing the moon is being directly aspected by is, of course, the sun directly across the sky at 13 degrees in Gemini. Um, we've got Mars at eight degrees of Leo. We've got Chiron at 18 degrees of uh, Aries. Those are pretty wide aspects. You know, I don't tend to really think about the aspects for the lunar moments, the lunar phases so much, unless they're really close to being uh, exact, but both of these planets are in fire signs. And so there is a type of resonance in the sky this week around, you know, Mars lending some energy to this, en to this experience and Chiron lending some energy to this experience. Mars is passionate and driven. Chiron is our sacred wound and the healing and the wielding of that uh, wisdom that we've earned from our sacred wound. So those two pieces are also kind of lending themselves to this full moon in Sagittarius. And then off to the side, of course, we can't have everything just be nice, right? We've got good old angry grandpa, uh, Saturn at seven degrees of Pisces. Now that's already passed, right? The moon's at 13 degrees, but we again, it's, it's there, right? It's Saturn <laughs> and Saturn gets fussy if you ignore them. Um, and we can think about it from the sense of Sagittarius is again, very philosophical and it is, I don't want to say higher minded, but deeper minded. It wants to push further into ideas than just hanging out on the surface of an idea. And Saturn is a type of teacher or mentor or guide um, it can do its job uh, in that work kind of harshly sometimes. And so, you know, it might not be like sweetness and light 24-7 through this full moon, but that's also part of what's really interesting about taking a philosophical approach to something is I think it gives room for there to be good, bad, easy, hard, uh, positive, negative, you know, <laughs> um, comfortable, uncomfortable, all at the same time. And we can sort of hold the collection of that with a little more grace. I say this a lot in the podcast and in the classes, but as witches, as pagans, as heathens, as magical people, as wizards, uh, we hold paradox frequently in our work. We hold the yes and the no at the same time frequently in our work. And uh, Sagittarius, in my opinion, is really good at that. 
um, is really good at hanging out in, in two different worlds, right? Think about the symbol of Sagittarius. It's not just an arrow, it's a centaur, which is half an animal and half a human. And so there's something about Sagittarius that is able to sort of stand with a foot in both worlds, in the mundane and the esoteric, and to be able to see things from a practical stance and a philosophical stance. Um, and maybe those things aren't even opposite. Maybe they're two sides of some other coin. All right. I'll just leave you with all of that, right? <laughs> so we are hanging out with the mutable fire of mutable air <clears throat> in this uh, whole conversation, right? We're still in Gemini season, mutable sign, Sagittarius, fiery, mutable sign. Um, and this is because we are engaging in deep shape-shifting, uh, as we move through these last four weeks of Beltane and summer, or excuse me, the last four weeks of Beltane and spring, um, we are changing shape. We are shedding whatever skins we need to shed to leave spring behind. And we are bringing up to the surface and beginning to embody whatever forms we need to be in to step into summer and litha season and the work that we're going to be doing there and the magic we're going to be doing there. So this whole season, this whole, these whole last weeks and days of this time period are really about what's done and let me clear space for what's to come. Okay. When we are hanging out with a full moon in Sagittarius for our, um, Oh, I should say this before I even get into that. Um, I should just look at my notes that I have directly in front of me and follow them, actually. <laughs> We're hanging out with the full moon. And I and I think I've already said this. It's the fruit. It's the results. It's the effects. It's the culmination. It can be a crisis point, but I mean crisis in the most neutral way, right? It's where the intensity sometimes gets a little ramped up in our lunar process. Um, other names for this moon, before I forget to say this. Strawberry moon the hot moon, the rose moon, mead moon, honey moon. <laughs> really? Yes, really. Uh, lotus moon, green corn moon, windy moon, um, moon of horses. Very interesting. Horses deeply connected to the sign of Gemini. Dyad moon, planting moon, and moon when June berries are ripe. I just learned about June berries from uh, a really cool content creator on the interwebs named Alexis Nicole. I'm sure you all probably follow her. Her her work is ridiculous and super cool. Um, black content creator, uh, femme, who, you know, is really kind of restoring uh, wild harvesting and educating people as she goes along. She's got a new thing on PBS. She's just incredible. <clears throat> Anyways. She just put up something about June berries. They are also often referred to as service berries, and they are indigenous all over North America. So this is a moon when we know those berries are coming ripe. They are absolutely delicious. They're really incredible. I'm so stoked that I learned about them from her. Um, okay. So last, last, last thing that I want to say about this moon, and then we'll get into the lunar body and plant body stuff, is that this moon is being ruled by Jupiter in Taurus. Um, Sagittarius's ruling planet is Jupiter. Jupiter's hanging out in Taurus, is going to be there for basically the next year. Um, and Jupiter in Taurus wants to uh, physically manifest whatever the stuff is that we are doing in that spiritual place, philosophical place, that, that stuff, uh, the deeper minded places, Jupiter's like totally, but what if we tried to like bring that out into the physical world? Um, and that I think can look very subjective and very different from person to person. So you might not be able to find a description of what that process looks like in a book somewhere. You might be able to read about how other people have manifested a process like that for themselves, but how you do it might be very different. And um, and so I encourage you thinking about what would it be for me to embody and physically manifest in the world my philosophical ideals? What could that look like? This is a moon that, um, like I said, in a sense, is a culminating point in that process, but and also truly 
might be a kicking off point in you thinking about that process too. Okay. For our lunar body work, when we are hanging out with a full moon in Sagittarius, we are resting, relaxing, supporting, nourishing, or otherwise restoring the lower back, the sciatic nerve family, and the thighs. As I say every single week, I am not a doctor of the human corpus. I am a doctor of the cauldron, and I will stir it up, but I have no medical training. So don't <laughs> listen to my advice, or if you want to listen to my advice, check in with your trusted health advisor, make sure that this is all safe for you to work with. And as I say every week, I also encourage you to work with the metaphor. So if you got something on your back and you need to get it off your back, this is the time, uh, you know, if, if for whatever reason, uh, you know, in the words of the great saint, Dr. Frankenfurter, it's time for you to build your thighs up. This is the moon to do it. <laughs> for our plant body work, <clears throat> because we are officially stepping into the waning half of the lunar cycle, we are pulling weeds. We are cutting trees or cutting wood for that's going to be used for firewood or lumber, perfect for a fire sign, plowing, cultivating, pruning trees and vines. We're doing pest and disease control on our plants. Um, and if we're doing any harvesting right now, we are harvesting below ground crops that we intend to dry and store. Uh, planting Biennials, perennials, bulbs, roots, trees, grapes, berries, potatoes, shrubs, that type of stuff. As we talked about last week, we are also officially stepping into the season of this is the bomb ass time to harvest things. Um, and I will say this again. I'm going to say it now. <laughs> I'm going to say it again over the next couple of months. This, this is the time for harvesting plant material for magic, um, for medicine, for food. Uh, because this is the fullness of the sun. This is the ripe, the ripe moment of the sun throughout this stretch of the year. Um, so we we want to think of the plants as being filled up with the power of the sun, and we're harvesting them at their fullness. All of that said, please don't be that guy. Harvest ethically. Uh, you know, for every four or five plants that you see, take one. Uh, if you see that a plant is not abundant in an area, don't take any, you know, do what you can to support that plant. And maybe next year when you come back, there'll be a ton of it and it'll be a great time to harvest it. Um, don't harvest from private property unless you have permission, you know, uh, leave no trace when you harvest. Don't damage the area. Don't tromp through someplace. Don't leave trash. Uh, don't just social media, the whole affair, have some moments for yourself in private. Always ask permission from the plants. You might get a no, even when it looks like there's a ton of plant to harvest. You don't know what's going on with that plant. So ask permission first. And if you get permission to harvest, always be ready to leave an offering as a means of saying thank you. If that's a little fertilizer, if that's some fresh water, if that's a prayer or a song, there's a ton of ways that you can say thank you to the planet and thank you to those plants um, for being willing to work with you on the stuff that you want to do. This is huge, guys. It's really, really important because these are literally the tools that we're going to be doing our magic with, right? We don't want to start that relationship with that tool on a bad note. <laughs> we don't want to start it with colonizer mentality of you're only growing so that I can harvest you and use you, right? This is a symbiotic relationship. Would you like to work with me in the magic that I'm hoping to do for the rest of the year? Are you the appropriate plant for that? Is that right for you, plant? That's the attitude that we want to come with. And then those plants that say yes, are you kidding me? Get the fuck out of here. Like that's going to be such potent magic. We don't want to work with plants that can't work with us or don't want to work with us or not appropriate to work with us. So ask, tap into that philosophical approach to the whole gig, right? Right. Okay. Uh, I think that's all I need to say about that moon. <laughs> no, 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 no. There's more. There's more. There's more. There's always more because I'm ruled by Jem <laughs> Jupiter. <laughs> we're only almost a half hour in and we're still talking about the full moon. Um, dream big on this moon. Seek the unknown. 
um, compromises and solutions to problems uh, really might be presenting themselves in big ways, meaningful answers. Um, we might be uh, capable of summoning a lot of enthusiasm on this moon. Um, and one of the things I wrote down in my notes was luck and prizes for those who go off road. Um, not following the beaten track is definitely a Sagittarius vibe. And so this is in particular a moon where there might be um, unnameable luck and prizes, <laughs> unnameable bonus rounds, right? That, that are available to us if we choose to go on a slightly different path, metaphorically or physically. Um, yeah, there's other stuff going on in the sky too with this moon. I know I'm just, I can't get off this moon. It's my moon. Um, there's other stuff going on in the sky with this moon. We have kind of a T-square between Venus and Pluto and Sag or excuse me, J uh, Jupiter and the North Node. Um, and that can get a little funky. There could be some weird power dynamic stuff that comes up. We have um, Mercury and Uranus are close to being uh, conjunct. We're going to talk about that more tomorrow, you know, for the fourth. But, um, but that can lend a slightly impatient vibe to stuff, a slightly like sped up, kind of like tweaked out vibe to things <laughs> for lack of a better way of describing it. Or we're like a little anxious and just a little like, you know, a little wound up about stuff. Um, and so go for a walk, do some deep breathing, stretch the body uh, in whatever ways are safe and healthy for you. Um, that, right? Like work it out, work it out. If you catch yourself starting to get a little wound up about stuff. Just take some deep breaths. Take your time. It's going to be okay. We got this. Okay. That's that's the end of what I have to say about this moon. I swear to God. That's it. We're done. Um, other than that, we have no astrology of note for this day. So now let us get into the holy days uh, that we find here on June 3rd. Kicking off our holy days uh, for June 3rd from our Roman friends and ancestors, we have Vesta Claudatur. This is the closing of the Temple of Vesta. We talked about Vestalia last week and uh, the opening of the Temple of Vesta the week before. And so here is the culmination and conclusion of that massive festival um, for folks uh, who weren't there. Vesta is the goddess of the hearth and the fire of the home, literally and metaphorically. Um, and so this is the closing up of her temple. And it doesn't mean the closing down. Um, the, the Temple of Vesta, of course, contained the sacred fire that was thought of as sort of the heart and hearth of Rome uh, and, and the Roman people. And so this is a, a sealing back up of that. Um, the temple was opened. Everybody could get a, a touch of the fire. Um, and now the temple is being closed back up. And then, and at that point, only the Vestal Virgins would be uh, getting access to that inner sanctum and all of that stuff. Um, but in theory, over the last week, the bless, the fiery blessings have gone out. Hmm. With the full moon in Sagittarius. I'm sure it's just a coincidence. <laughs> Also this day from our Chinese friends and ancestors, we have the Dragon Boat Festival. Uh, let me pull up my notes here very quickly. Um, the Dragon Boat Festival is a traditional Chinese holiday, which occurs on the fifth day of the fifth month of the Chinese calendar, um, which this year corresponds to now. Um, and, uh, the, that's basically it. It's the Dragon Boat Festival. It's a celebration of boats, dragons, watery stuff. Um, but also, <laughs> uh, Duan Yu is what the festival is called in Mandarin Chinese. Please forgive my pronunciation. I'm sure I didn't get that exactly right. It literally means the starting or opening horse, i.e. the first horse day to occur on the month. Um... It also can be the day of the horse in the animal cycle. Um, again, we will see horses 
across the board when we are talking about Gemini season. I talk about this a lot more than we have room for in this podcast in a piece called Gemini, the Divine Twins, which is on my website. You can go to the Beltane link at the top in the menu, scroll down, and you'll find all of the Beltane season related writings and classes and things like that listed towards the bottom of the page. Um, and big, big piece on this. Horses and Gemini, side by side. Very interesting to think of Gemini as twins riding horses and Sagittarius is a, uh, you know, centaur, which is half horse and half person. And these two signs oppose each other. Again, I'm sure it's just a coincidence. <laughs> and yet, here we are. <laughs> Also on this day, we have big, big festivals from our Ifa friends and ancestors, our Yoruba friends and ancestors. We have uh, the Yoruba New Year is happening at this time. June 3rd, generally speaking, is the onset of the Yoruba New Year. This year is year 1065. Yeah, their calendars go back 10,000 years. Pay attention, people. <laughs> <laughs> when they say most of this stuff in the West started in Africa, this is what they're talking about. <laughs> it did. <laughs> um, and on this day, uh, some pretty big deal deities are recognized and celebrated. We have the Feast of Eshu Elegua. We have the Feast of Orumila. Uh, and the Ifa festival itself, which is, you know, a celebration of the culture, a celebration of the Ifas themselves, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so briefly, just to catch us up to speed, who is Elegua, a deity of the roads, crossroads, um, a master of force, uh, he is the owner of caminos or roads or paths in Santeria. Um, and isn't Gemini and Mercury concerned with travel and roads and magic? Wow, that's, huh, what what a coincidence. Who, who saw that coming? Those guys literally saw that coming. <laughs> and who is Oren Mila? This is the Orisha of wisdom, knowledge, and divination, and the first Babaloa. Um, or, excuse me, Babalao. Um and again, these are all words that we put under Mercury, the ruler of Gemini. So we are deep in Gemini season and we are deep in the Gemini symbolism and magic. Okay, those are our holy days for uh, June 3rd. So let's move on to June 4th. Um, nothing big happening except, oh my God, it's a Mercury conjunct Uranus and Taurus at 20 degrees kind of a moment. <clears throat> Did I just have a whole bunch to say about Mercury? Wait a minute. Like I said, <laughs> we're going in hard this week, kids. <laughs> it's all lining up for it's all lining up, man. <laughs> Again, cut to me in the meme of Charlie from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia with all with like the strings and the graphs all over the wall. That's the, the life we're living right now. So what do we get with Mercury conjunct Uranus? What is that kind of energy? It can be spicy and it can be awesome. This is one of those moments where Uranus shows how wildly subjective its experiences can be. And we talked about this last week when we had some uh, bumpy Uranus uh, conjunctions, I think, with the sun. Um, what's up with this? Uranus introduces the unexpected. Uranus introduces um, the weird, the odd, the different. Um, the unusual, like, as I said, the unexpected, the surprising. And if you are a person who really likes and depends on things being predictable, things being the same, things being in a pattern, then Uranus days can be tough because it's like, oh my God, what is this random thing that's popping up out of nowhere? If you're a person that likes spontaneity, that enjoys the radical change that suddenly occurs or big surprises, then Uranus days can be super fun for you. Um, how can we work with this energy? Uranus plus Mercury is, holy crap, I have this amazing new idea. Wow, wow, wow. 
I've never thought about it this way before. We've never said this before. I've never seen this piece of information before. And it's changing my whole understanding of the thing. And is that helpful or is that a pain in the ass? Depends on where you are in your process and how you deal with change and, you know, sudden shifts in stuff. Um, you know, it can be a, an extremely innovative transit. It can be an extremely activating transit. Um, it can also be difficult to focus because the ideas are flying at you from all angles. Um, and it, again, if you're a person who needs it calm and likes it to be predictable and sedentary, this can be a day that feels kind of anxious, that feels kind of tense, that feels like it's going too fast. Um, not a super great day for talking shit. Not a super great day for that. Probably going to come back on you. We'll talk about that later in the month. Um, but could be an interesting day for in inventions, uh, advances in tech, that kind of stuff. Um, so the other thing I will say about Uranus stuff is slow down. Uranus and Mars both tend to encourage us on the unconscious level to kick into autopilot and just kind of speed through what we're going, going through, whatever we're doing. We're way more focused on what's coming next versus what's happening right now. And we won't watch our feet. We might bump into somebody in traffic. We might trip on things. So just on this day when you're like, yeah, getting ramped up, still just be chill. <laughs> Again, stretch the body, do some deep breathing as a means of like riding the current rather than being swept away by this electric jam. Um, the other thing that's happening on June 4th is, this is a bit more esoteric. You can do some reading about this. I'm not going to go in too hard on it, but Venus is reaching its greatest Eastern elongation. Um, at the beginning, or in last week, we talked about Mercury reaching its greatest Western elongation. And this is um, a relational pattern between the sun and these two planets, the sun and Mercury and the sun and Venus. Um, it's basically saying this is as far away from the sun as Venus is going to get in one direction uh, because Venus and Mercury really hug the sun at all times. They're never more than a sign or two away at any given time. Um, and so we can uh, start to uh, look to the West after sunset to see Venus as a beautiful evening star, kind of overseeing whatever work we're doing here. Um, beautiful, 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 beautiful. Okay, moving on to uh, June 5th. Am I ready to do that? Yes, I am. No, I'm not. <laughs> because we haven't even talked about the holy days of June 4th. Look, I'm a professional, okay? I don't need you looking at me like that. I know what I'm doing, kind of. So just, should okay, holy days for June 4th <laughs> might look a little something like this. From our European and pagan friends and ancestors, we have the Feast of the Triple Goddess. Um, this is something that we see both as a modern placement, but there are traces of something like this happening in pagan cultures going back a ways into the misty mists of time. Uh, who's the triple goddess? Just, just the, just the bomb. That's all. Just, just the maiden mother crone, NBD. Um, the triple goddess concept, there's some conjecture around it. There are Historians and anthropologists that are like, no, 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 this has been around forever. And there's other historians and anthropologists that are like, no, 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 this is totally a modern invention. I'm like, who cares? Does it work? Cool. <laughs> um, do we have a perfect record of pagan history everywhere? Uh, no, we don't. Actually, <laughs> we've experienced a little diaspora and erasure ourselves. So there might not be a record of that going back to the dawns of time. Um, but this is a beautiful day for focusing on the triple goddess, the goddess as the maiden mother crone, um, or any deities that uh, are triplicate <laughs> deities that have three parts to them. Uh, Kali, of course, always comes to mind as a producer, a sustainer, and a destroyer. Um, and so we can also think about individual deities that have multiple roles, especially if they have three main roles that they play. 
Also on this day, we have, from our Catholic friends and ancestors, Trinity Sunday. Wow! I'm, again, I'm having to say this so many times this week. I'm sure it's just a coincidence that we have Trinity Sunday on the same day that we have the Feast of the Triple Goddess. Hmm. Hmm. I wonder where they got that idea. Theft. Theft is where they got that idea. <laughs> um, and this is a focus on for our Catholic and Christian friends and ancestors. Uh, um, their deity as a triple deity, right? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The, the Son would be youthful, right? The Father, it's kind of like parent, like midlife kind of. And then the Holy Ghost, sort of an aged, wise, huh? Yeah. Yeah, no, I don't, that's hmm, crazy. Okay, what else is happening on this day? <laughs> From our Orthodox Catholic friends and family, we have Pentecost. And what is Pentecost? Pentecost is also referred to as Wit Sunday or Wit Sun or White Sun. This is a Christian holiday which takes place after Easter, and it commemorates the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles and other followers of Jesus, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, what do I think is really important here? Uh, that this is also called White Sunday or Whit Sun or Whit Sunday because as we move through Gemini season and we approach Litha or summer solstice, we have more and more imagery of our deities showing up as literally white, as in not, not Caucasian, not pale skinned, no color, white, um, and glowing often with a brilliant glowing head or their whole body is brilliant and glowing, or they are this white fire that is descending down from the sky. Now let's just take a moment here. So at summer solstice, we will have the sun as high in the sky as it can be directly overhead raining down its 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 greatest power and brilliance and light of the year huh i wonder where they got the idea wild okay cool that's cute uh <laughs> um so that right and again we we sort of have this reiteration of this symbolism over and over and over again this is one of those weeks where we get a lot of it. Uh, so moving on. Also on this day from our Korean friends and ancestors, we have the festival of Dano or the Dano festival. This is also called Suri Nal. Uh, this is a Korean traditional holiday. Again, falling on the fifth day of the fifth month. Um, it's celebrated in North Korea and South Korea. Um, and this is a day of spiritual rites. Folks enjoy song and dance and good food and good drink. Uh, women would wash their hair in boiled sweet flag, which is a type of herb, um, to make their hair shiny and beautiful. But again, here we're seeing this incorporation of utilizing herbs for their power. Interesting. Um, women also put angelica flowers in their hair out of the belief that it would repel evil. Again, this incorporating of herbs and flowers into the the work um people wore blue and red clothes dyed uh hairpins red with iris roots men wore iris roots woven around their waist so we are really incorporating herbs and flowers in the natural world on this Herbs wet with dew in the morning were said to heal stomach aches and wounds. And we know that going out on May Day uh, the be at the beginning of Beltane and touching the dew on the grass or on plants at the beginning at sunrise, beginning of the day, sunrise, putting that on our face uh, brings, you know, beauty and love and, and luck. So this idea of dew found in the morning at sunrise on plants that precious water that appears overnight magically on these plants and taking that up and utilizing that in this Beltane season is a big deal and we're seeing it through through multiple cultures through multiple times um dano also called surit nal which means high day or the day of the god but the word surit harkens back to the word suri which means wheel <laughs> ha 
Interesting stuff, people. Very interesting stuff. There's a lot more information about this festival out on the internet. I encourage checking it out. Okay. Also on this day from our Slavic friends and ancestors, we have the day of Yarilo or Yarilo's day. Who is Yarilo? An Eastern and Southern Slavic god of vegetation, fertility, and springtime. Uh, a life, death, rebirth deity. Um, and they represented the sacred youthful life force and was associated with spring and agricultural fertility. Huh, interesting. What I love here is this. Yarilo had a twin sister. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> what? In the midst of Gemini season, the twins? Are you kidding me? Come on. Come on. Come on. I love it. And last but not least, uh, from our Icelandic friends and ancestors, we have Siemens Day. Look at me right now. Stop it. No. No. Okay. Uh, ha ha ha. But this is a modern tradition that some folks think reach very, very far back in time. Uh, this would have been a day for um, blessing boats blessing harbors, blessing the waterways, and blessing the folks, the mariners that are going to go out onto the ocean and the high seas and go fishing, or they're doing um, trading routes, you know, there's their merchant ships or their sail uh, fishing boats, um, either way. And we see a ton of that also in Gemini season because Mercury oversees um, mariners and maritime activities is a protector of boats. As we talked about last week, um, St. Elmo's fire is the lightning that hits the masts at the tops of ships. And when there was two of them, they were referred to as Castor and Pollux, the two twins of Gemini. Can't make it up people. And really there's no need to, because we've got plenty of it hanging out. <laughs> All right, let's move on to uh, Monday, June 5th. Shall we? Monday, June 5th, what have we got going on? Well, first off, uh, our moon enters Capricorn. I'm not going to go in too hard on this, but um, while the moon is in Capricorn, I've been leaving this off. I'm going to try including it again for the not, yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, resting, relaxing, nourishing, supporting, or otherwise restoring bones, hair, nails, and teeth. These are the parts of the body uh, ruled by Capricorn or overseen by Capricorn. So yes, the hot oil treatment is the Manny Petty holy act. Yes, 100%. Um, maintaining or breaking down old containers, borders, fences, beds, structures, all under the rulership of Capricorn because it is ruled by Saturn, who oversees boundaries and containers of things. So this is a great time to either repair those things or break them down and compost that stuff and get it ready to be reused in some other way, um, et cetera, et cetera. As well as most of the other plant stuff that I said for Sagittarius, all, all applying, applying here. Um, so... What else is happening on this day? Oh, just a little old thing of Venus moving into Leo. Dun, 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 dun. Uh, does Venus like being in Leo? Yeah. Yeah, they do. Absolutely. Are you kidding me? Get out of here. Yes. <laughs> Venus, uh, the fashionista moving into the sign of Leo, <laughs> the great ham. <laughs> we love you, Leos. Uh, please share the spotlight. It's I know it pains you, but you can try. <laughs> um, what are the vibes? Venus is going to be entering Leo for everybody. So take a second, pull out your natal chart, find Leo, find the beginning of Leo. Venus is moving in right there. So wherever Venus goes, it wants to stir up conversations on the surface around uh, appearance, um, being delightful, being lovely, um, being perceived as delicious and wonderful. Um, so you might be stirred up to like pull some stuff out of the closet that you haven't worn for a while. Um, you might all together want to be just a little flashier, whatever that means for you, um, in your fashion, in your appearance, in your presentation to the world. Um, Venus wants to taste good stuff, wear things that are comfortable and beautiful, wants to sit on comfortable, beautiful couches, all of that stuff. Venus wants opulence and deliciousness. 
Um, and you know, and who doesn't? God is blessed, right? <laughs> um, and there's a very regal and magnanimous vibe to this Leo energy, along with being the spotlight hog, which we love you for that. Uh, but underneath it all, what Leo really hopes that you never find out about them is that they're very magnanimous, they're very generous, and they're very noble. Um, and so Venus rolling through here really wants to stir up that energy too. Yeah, I want to look fabulous while I'm saying saving the world, but I do also want to save the world. <laughs> um, and on a deeper level, Venus is talking about values. Venus is talking about what do we treasure? Um, what are the things that we think are important and good for us? Uh, that the sweetness in life that we want to pull closer to us. And so Venus stepping into Leo is adding a flashier element to that work or that process that we're doing. All in all, it's lovely. Now, side note, and we'll talk about this later this, excuse me, later this month and into next month, uh, Venus is going to station retrograde in this sign. So if Venus is aspecting something, in your chart while it's hanging out in Leo? Do you have planets in Leo? Do you have planets in Aries or Sagittarius? That's being complemented. Those are, those are in harmony with each other. Um, do you have planets in Taurus or Scorpio or Aquarius? That's a square or an opposition. So there might be a little friction or some adjustment that needs to be made. And, you know, where does Venus have a hard time? controlling their urges, controlling their spending, controlling their desire for deliciousness. So we can overdo it too when Venus is doing stuff and we are having like a square in opposition with Venus. So again, we'll talk about that more as we get closer to the retrograde. That will be Venus's only retrograde this year. Um, and yeah, there, there might be a few bumps, but I, I think it's going to be okay. Uh, but yeah, Venus enters Leo on this day. Beautiful. Absolutely lovely. Wait, only hours later, <laughs> as we've talked about previously in the last couple of months, Venus steps into Leo and is immediately hitting that zero degree mark and is in opposition to Pluto in Aquarius. That can feel spicy. That can feel quite intense. So while Venus's transit in total through Leo is going to have some beautiful moments, there are going to be some moments of friction. So let's talk about this for a second. Venus plus Pluto is tough. What we're seeing in any transits that involve Venus and Pluto, regardless of the aspect, square, trine, opposition, conjunction, whatever, we're seeing the great underworld journey of Persephone play out, right? That's, that's who this is. That's what we're literally talking about. We're talking about Venus, Aphrodite, um, Persephone. Um, going into the underworld, Pluto, Hades. It's that These are the archetypes. This is the myth that we're working with. And we've talked about a variety of interpretations of this myth. So on one level, this might bring some shadowy drama to your relationships. There might be some underworld stuff that comes up in your relationships with loved ones. That can be family, that can be lovers, that can be our domestic partners, um, our besties, whatever, the people that we love. Um, if there's some stuff that's been unresolved, if there's some funky BS, um, it might be coming to the surface to be worked on right now. And again, we're retrograding here. So this isn't necessarily going to be a one and done. This might be an opening of a conversation that continues throughout summer. Uh, but also when Pluto's involved, it's like, hey, this is this is ooky stuff that needs to get brought up to the surface and worked on. So here we go. And when we are uh, moving with that energy, when that is like, yes, I need to be here. I need to be doing this energy or need to be doing this work. It can still be difficult, but um, it can bring a level of diplomacy to this work. Of course, Venus wants to keep things cute at all times. And Pluto is like, I don't know her. <laughs> I am never concerned with keeping things cute. In fact, I want to keep things as spooky as possible. So we can see, you know, where the tension is between these two plan planets and what they represent. So relationship stuff, relationship stuff, relationship stuff might be coming up for you on this day slash this might be kicking off a conversation that 
takes place in a bunch of different ways, like I said, over the course of the summer. When stuff is not cool between these two, um, we can be obsessive, we can be addictive. Um, so this might be a day where you meet somebody or you have a conversation online with someone or you go on that first date with someone and you can't stop thinking about them. OMG. And you get a little addicted to that person. You get a little obsessive about whatever it was that incurred between, or maybe you're experiencing that energy on the receiving end where somebody meets you and is like way too into it. And it feels weird for you. Either way, it's intense. And that's really kind of the neutral word that we want to keep in the back of our minds is relationship stuff plus intensity. Um, so be kind with yourself on this day. Take a walk around the block. You know, I always say, put yourself in timeout if you need to. If something happens and you're just like, whoa, that was a lot. Um, you know, I'm losing my mind right now. Or this person seems to like not be able to hear me say, no, that's enough. Be aware and be present for those types of moments. On the world scale, this isn't boding well for gender politics, you know, um, slash maybe it is, right? Because again, Pluto is like, all I'm doing is pointing at what's not healthy here. I'm pointing at the rot. That's my job, says Pluto. I'm pointing at the spooky shadow stuff that we collectively need to be healing and processing. And so, you know, Pluto work, and I've said this many times before, but Pluto work oftentimes can feel like we are working, we're going backwards way ever before we make forward progress. Um, so there might be some sliding backwards. There might be some more crap. I mean, that's not, I don't need to practice astrology to be able to predict that, right? Like we can just literally look at our country and the direction that it seems to be heading in and say, you know. Things may be getting worse before they get better. So take care of yourself. Take care of the femmes in your world. Take care of the NBs in your world, the non-binary folks in your world. Um, take care of the trans people in your world because, um, and if you are non-binary, if you are trans, if you identify as femme, um, take care of yourself. Ask for help. Let your community know that you need support in, in what's happening right now because um, we're being persecuted. Um, if somebody tells you something, believe them. Uh, if somebody is saying, this is spooky, this is scary, this is freaking me out, believe them and support them. That's the name of the game right now. That's what's up. Uh, okay, so that's our astrology for Monday, June 5th. Um, now taking a moment to look at the holy days of June 5th. We are kicking it off with a heliacal rising from the fixed star Cursa. And Cursa is found in the constellation The River, or Eridanus. Um, the traditional name of Cursa comes from the Arabic phrase Al-Kursi Al-Jaza. Again, apologies for pronunciations. I try my best. Um, which means the chair or the footstool of the central one. And this is going to connect to another fixed star that we're going to work with in just a second. Um, the fixed star itself doesn't have a super great vibe um, in astrology, but whatever. What I think is very important is that this star is basically thought of as the most northerly star in the constellation of the river. It's basically the mouth of the river or the source of the river. Did we already have waterway blessings this week? Have we had some last week? We're going to have some next week. Yep. So here a lot in alignment with that mercurial Gemini symbology and uh, imagery of waterways, blessing waterways and the people who work waterways. Here we are at the mouth of the river. We are about to go on that adventure. Um, and so I think that that is what's very interesting here. But also, again, it also has this name of the chair or the footstool of the central one. And um, central one, you know, AKA God, powerful stuff, the deity, the, the, the bad bitch, the boss, what have you. Um, and again, that's going to connect to another one of our fixed stars here in just a second. I'm going to hold you, put a pin in that. Let's talk about what else is happening on this day. From our Catholic friends and ancestors, we have the feast of St. Isidro, Isidro the laborer, 
Um, this is uh, uh, St. Isidore of Seville, etc., etc. Lots of things could be said about this character. I'm not going to get into all of that. Here's what I think is very interesting. This saint is one portrayed as a peasant holding a sickle and a sheaf of corn. Is this the green corn full moon? Hmm. There we go. Um, are we in the midst of planting and, and plowing season? Yes, we are. Uh, an angel plows for this character, for this saint. Interesting. What else is depicted with this character? An angel and a white ox. So there's our Taurus connection to the beginning of Beltane season and white, right? Again, uh, that thing popping up for us here in the midst of Gemini season as we approach summer solstice, another deity, not deity, but another entity, another magical or spiritual entity with glowing whiteness or brilliance um, or white being a, a central facet. That's all I'm going to say about that character. Okay, moving on to our Shinto friends and ancestors, we have the Atsura Matsuri Festival. Um, this is a really cool festival that happens every year at one of the oldest shrines in Japan. Um, and there's dances, there's drumming, uh, big floats, ha -ha. <laughs> uh, seasonal kimono are worn, uh, at this time and um, there's fireworks and great food and archery interesting Sagittarius the archer uh-huh people the signs are all around you if your eyes are open to see them uh, but this is this festival has been happening for almost 1800 years right so kind of a big deal uh, as I said I think I already said this fireworks and stuff like that when the sun sets thousand year old camphor trees are lit with 365 lanterns. Very, very interesting. Um, very, very interesting. The year, right? The wheel, the year. I'm telling you people, it's right there under your noses. You just got to look. Also on this day from our Gnostic friends and ancestors, we have the celebration of Earth Mother Day. This is exactly what it sounds like. This is a moment when our Gnostic friends take, take a second to bless the earth, praise the earth, um, give a prayer for the earth. Uh, if that feels right to you, certainly join in, um, recognizing the earth as the mother of us all. And from our Celtic friends and ancestors, we have Domnas Day. Now this is a, a deity that I have had a hard time finding information on in the past and still have a hard time finding information. I have found deities with similar names uh, in Rome, we know that Rome really overtook the Western European Isles at some point, And a lot of like, whatever was happening before that sort of got swept away and rolled up into the Latin and Roman stuff that the Roman invaders brought with them. So I think this is my opinion. I think that Domnas is a, a version of the word Domina aka a goddess of some type, domina, um, of some sort. And, um, and that this, uh, this probably supplanted something else that was already happening on this day for the people who were natively in that area when the Romans showed up. Maybe, uh, oh, the one other thing that I have found is that there is a goddess with a very similar name who is the daughter of the sun. Ha <laughs> uh, ha! So maybe that is a connection there for us as well. Maybe. Interesting. I encourage you to go research it and see what you can find. Report back! Uh, when you, <laughs> when you, with your, with your studies. All right. Uh, let's head on to Tuesday, June 6th. But before that, how about an ad? Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, if you love this podcast, you can support this work through Patreon. Thank you a bajillion billion times. See, the, the sirens are going off even as I say it. Um, thank you so, so much to my patrons. Um, you guys don't even know. <laughs> you don't even know. 
Thank you so much. Uh, you can sub for as little as a dollar if you just think this podcast is dope and you want to support it. Uh, I don't run ads on the podcast, um, partly because I don't want to and partly because I won't get paid even if I do. Uh, so screw them, man. Um, you can sub, as I said, for as little as a buck or $5, even if you want to just support the podcast. And this is plenty of information. But if you want even more information, um, you know, extra podcasts, extra videos, extra information about the Wheel of the Year, magical practices, tarot, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, subbing at the higher levels, you get all kinds of cool free stuff. And at the even higher levels, uh, you get free readings every month with me um, to be able to integrate all of this information into your personal life based on what's going on in your natal chart and all of that other good stuff. Join and change your life forever. Or, you know, whatever. Thanks so much for the support. If you can't support financially, I completely understand because life sucks on earth right now. It's too expensive for everything. Um, tell a friend, share it on social media, uh, give it a thumbs up. If you're feeling especially hedonistic, you can leave a rating or a review. All right. That's the end of the ad. Let's get back to the podcast. That brings us to Tuesday, June 6th. Our astrology for this day. Not much. Really nothing much. <laughs> there is something, but it's in the notes. For patrons, sign up to Patreon, $5 and higher, and you'll get access to the notes for uh, the podcast every week. <laughs> Which has links sometimes, if I have time to put them in there. But it always has uh, the charts for the moon. And I will occasionally put charts up for uh, whatever other spicy astrology is happening for the week. Uh, tarot cards, etc., etc. Okay. Um, so directly to the holy days for June 6th, we have from our Greek friends and ancestors, Artemisia. Um, this is a festival dedicated to the goddess Artemis, uh, the goddess of the hunt, the goddess of wild animals, um, the wilderness, nature, vegetation, childbirth, care of children. Um, she was heavily identified or is heavily identified with Selene, the personification of the moon and Hecate, another lunar deity. And so we could say that she's kind of a triple goddess. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> she roamed the forests of Greece, uh, attended by her large entourage, mostly made up of nymphs, some mortals, and hunters. Diana is her Roman equivalent. Um, she is the twin sister of Apollo. So here again, twins hanging out in the situation. Okay. Uh, moving on to the other holy day here from our Yoruba friends and ancestors, we have the Feast of Ochosi. Ochosi is an Orisha uh, that is dedicated to what? The hunt, forests, animals, <laughs> the wilderness. Um, you know, how many times are we going to say it this week? I'm sure it's just a coincidence that these are happening on the same day. Um, and their symbol, the bow and arrow. You got to love it. It's like right there. Um, through that, Oshosi is also synchronized with St. Sebastian, one of the great gay saints, <laughs> Stat, you know, filled with arrows, right? Depicted, covered with arrows. Um, also connected to St. George, who we talked about a few weeks ago. Um, yeah. Okay. So that moves us to, that's everything that we got for Tuesday, June 6th. That's it. That's all the spice. So moving on to Wednesday, June 7th at 4.05 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Later in the day for everybody else around the planet, we have our disseminating moon in Aquarius at one degree. This is a moon that's got some baggage. This is a moon that's got a few things going on. It is conjunct Pluto in Aquarius at zero degrees opposing Venus at one degree in Leo, square the North Node and square the South Node in uh, at one degree of Taurus and one degree of Scorpio, respectively. So that's a lot of words. Let's break it down. First off, what do we get with a disseminating moon? Uh, our, our, our metaphor that we work with every month, the in the disseminating moon phase, 
the fruit that has appeared at the full moon begins to ripen. Um, it is a time to reap the rewards or begin to experience the fallout or the effects of whatever went down on the full moon. Um, oftentimes, whatever we see kind of pop up at the full moon begins to play out or resolve itself or settle itself out here a few days later at the disseminating moon and in the subsequent couple days. And again, depending on what that is, that could be cool or that could be like, oh no, <laughs> uh, here is the other shoe dropping. Here we go. So, you know, we want to work with that, right? Um, moon in Aquarius, disseminating moon in Aquarius in particular, um, we are pushing into ideas. We are pushing into the social work that needs to be done. And um, we are checking in with, you know, the revolution. Basically, we're checking in with what revolutionary actions have been taking place and how is that stuff settling out? Again, just popping out to the world stage moment or the country stage anyways, the U.S. level, um, there could be some more fallout from stuff that happened January 6th a couple years ago. Um, we'll see. We've also seen folks that are putting together um, bail funds uh, for people that have been protesting Cop City in Atlanta. Those people are being raided right now by the police. Uh, for setting up those bail funds. So, you know, the, the revolution might be taking a hit in a variety of ways at that time or at this time during this week. Let's look at the rest of that stuff, though. Conjunct Pluto, opposing Venus, square the nodes. That's tense, guys. That could be some funky business. Um, moon conjunct Pluto you know, emotionally, we are diving into the depths, whether we want to or not. So this might be a day where we need to take extra special care and recognize we might be a little sensitive on this day. Moon oppose Venus, definitely emo, definitely sensitive, definitely a day that we're like, I emotionally don't want to hear it. I don't want to handle it. I don't want to see it. I don't want to. Um, so the tension the work, the whatever that may have come up for you with the Venus opposing Pluto on the 5th might be rearing its head again on this day. This might be a day where that conversation is continuing. And with a square from the nodes, we, you know, we talk about the nodes, right? Um, it could be bringing up short-sighted issues um, of like, I want this, or I'm meant for that, or this is my destiny. And how dare you get in the way of that? I'm meant to be this thing, or I'm supposed to go in this direction, or this thing is supposed to happen for me. And you are stopping me from that. Or these emotional situations are hindering my progress here. Could be a way that that plays out for you on the personal level. Um, this is a pretty intense square opposition thing that's going on in the sky. And um, it's in Aquarius, Leo, Scorpio, Taurus. So it's all the fixed signs are involved in this. And fixed signs want to hold still. They want to maintain the status quo. We rely on the work that we do in fixed signs to help us maintain the status quo. But also, we all know that there are times where change is appropriate and healthy. To evolve something at sometimes is appropriate and healthy. To adapt, to modify, or even to end things is appropriate and healthy. And on this day, even if we logically or intellectually know change is good, modification would be helpful here, in our heart, in our, in our emotional spaces, we might be like, no. <laughs> I don't want to, and you can't make me. Even if I know intellectually this is healthy for me, emo intellectually, I know that this is healthy. Emotionally, I don't care. <laughs> emotionally, I just want things to stay as they are. Um, so be kind with yourself. 
leave room for that kind of stuff. Leave room for just like maybe a little temper tantrum on this day or just feeling like a little emotionally sensitive on this day or a lot emotionally <laughs> sensitive on this day. And again, this is a day where you might need to put yourself in time out. You might need to take a walk around the block and yell at a tree. Um, uh, and in those moments, I always encourage ask for time say, Hey, I can't think straight about this right now. Can I get back to you later today? Can I talk to you about this tomorrow? Thank you for bringing this up. It's hard for me to hear. Can I have a moment to process and, and digest this before I give you some kind of a response or feedback? Can I have a moment to just sit with this difficult information that you're bringing me or this tough moment that's happening? Um, and hopefully people are graceful with you and give you that moment. And it might be vice versa. It might be that you have to deliver some difficult information or that you are bringing up tough emotional stuff um, that needs to be worked on. It's appropriate to do it, but it doesn't make it hard, easier. And the person or people that you're talking to are like, I need a minute. Give those folks that grace and say, that's cool. Let's talk about it tomorrow. I appreciate that you are here with me and willing to do this tough work. Um, you know, on a national level, on an international level, moments like this can sort of feel like, you know, what is it our destiny as a species to evolve or to destroy ourselves, <laughs> you know, right? Jury's still out on that one, seems like. <laughs> um, but I think at times part of why the 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 world level stuff the societal level stuff can feel so difficult is because at moments like this, again, Pluto is shy, trying to show us what's broken or what's going horribly wrong so that we can fix it and have it go right. And that implies hope, which is a deeply Sagittarian thing. Um, it's a deeply Jupiterian thing. And hope is also very, very painful. It's way easier it's way safer for us emotionally and psychologically to stay pessimistic because we don't get our hopes up for them just to be disappointed, right? We stay disappointed. You don't have to get disappointed if you stay disappointed, right? <laughs> it's very that. Um, and, and so moments like this can also give us a glimpse of like, if only we got our shit together, look at how cool it could be. And, you know, with the nodes sort of showing us like the potential of the future, like if only we came into alignment with our destiny, if only we came into alignment with our potential as a species, we could just like be dope and do cool things and cruise around space and have a nice time. Uh, but we are still, you know, crapping our pants as a species and expecting everybody else to clean it up. So it could be a day where we, where we are sitting at that crossroads of like seeing how cool it could be and also seeing how not cool it currently is. Also, again, another day where there might be some attacks on gender, there might be attacks on our, our trans family um, and stuff. And again, don't need to be an astrologer to be, be able to predict that, but could be particularly spicy on these days. Take care of yourself. Um, be easy with yourself. Aquarius is an air sign. It's mental. It wants to pull in as much information as possible to have a handle on things, but Aquarius is also very philosophical in its approach to things. Um, and so, uh, so there is a little element there of like, wow, this is a lot, but maybe I can pull out and sort of see the big picture view as a means of getting a little distance between me and this intense stuff. Okay. When we are hanging out with a disseminating moon in Aquarius, for our lunar body work, we are resting, relaxing, nourishing, supporting, or otherwise restoring the legs, especially the knees and ankles. I highly recommend this, not just because this is our work, but we are heading into the high part of the season and we all are going to be going outside more often, most likely. Whether we are Safely, I hope, attending festivals or attending concerts, we might be going to street fairs, or we might just be doing more camping and more hiking. It's We've all had a very sedentary last few years, 
take some extra time to do some extra stretches, make sure that your feet and your ankles and your knees and your legs in general are supported and healthy in whatever it is that you're going to do out there. Okay. For our plant body work, we are pulling weeds, cutting trees for firewood and lumber, plowing, cultivating, pruning trees and vines, doing pest and disease control, harvesting below ground for uh, stuff that we're going to dry and store, planting biennials, perennials, bulbs, roots, trees, grapes, berries, potatoes, shrubs, just like for Sagittarius. Okay. What other astrology do we have for this day? Take a sip of my beverage and jump directly into that Venus and Leo square the north and south nodes. So it comes into exactitude here. Um, and we've talked about that within the course of the, um, the, the disseminating moon here. Um, so that's, what's up. That's, that's, that's in the background. Venus is square Venus in Leo square, the North and South nodes in Taurus and Scorpio respectively. Um, yeah, that's it. I don't really have anything else to say about that. So let us get into the holy days of uh, June 7th, we have first off the heliacal rising of the fixed star Rigel or Rigel. Uh, the modern name Rigel uh, translation uh, translates from um, from the Arabic phrase Rigel Josa al Yusra, which means the left leg or the left foot of Jaza or Joza. Um, Regal means foot. Uh, Joza means Orion. There is also the name uh, El Gabar or El Jabar. Um, maybe that is vaguely connected to our Elegua name that we mentioned earlier in the podcast. I don't know. Just just considering that as an option, not saying that that is actually connected. But here we have the foot of the Great One. So our last fixed star, Cursa, was the foot rest, and now we have the foot. Um, and I'm also thinking about this in context of, of Cursa being the mouth of the river, right? It's both of those things. And so here we basically have like the step at the mouth of the river that the great one is stepping into the great one is stepping into the river is how I see that connection. Um, and I think that that is a tiny and a giant metaphor for us to work in that we are stepping into an energy current as we move out of spring and into summer, right? And things are going to speed up a little bit and we're going to get swept off into our summertime adventures and, you know, the people and the places and the things that we're going to experience in those places. Um, we are, of course, the great one, but also this is in reference to deity, cosmos, the source, all of that good stuff. Um, the great one is Orion, the hunter. Wait a minute. Didn't we have a, huh? Say it with me. I'm sure it's just a coincidence. <laughs> Ah, ah, I told you we were going in hard this week. <laughs> I told you we were going in hard this week. <laughs> um, but yeah, here we go. And, um, and I think that that con that, that connection there is, is trippy and cool. Um, what, what is it to step purposefully into the adventure? What is it to see the stream of energy it's moving faster than we're currently moving, and we are consciously and purposefully stepping into that energy. I think that that is a lot of the work that we're doing in this week. Okay. The other holy day that we have at this time from our Roman friends and ancestors is the Dies Natalis for the Temple of Minerva. Of course, just to re remind you, the Dies Natalis means the birthday of the temple uh, dedicated to that deity. So it means, you know, the first brick was laid on this day or the temple might have been opened on this day. There's some sort of starting for the temple, the bot, the building itself. But we know how the Romans were about inanimate objects. They saw them as living entities as much as the deities and, and other humans. So this literally would have been like a worshiping of the temple itself. Like, hooray, you were born on this day, temple. Good job. 
Who's Minerva? This is a Roman goddess of wisdom, justice, law, victory, and a sponsor of the arts, trade, and strategy. Uh, Minerva is not a patron of violence like Mars, but strategic war. And even though we're not working with it right now, that makes me think of the Seven of Swords. In the Seven of Swords, uh, in the Smith Weight deck, you know, we see a person who is depicted um, stealing a bunch of swords, potentially, right? They've, there's tents in the background and things like that. And um, there's a conversation often between the idea of victory and defeat. But I think that there's an equally interesting conversation around the differences between victory and uh, peace. And um, there's an implication in victory versus defeat that somebody had to go to war, somebody had to win, somebody had to lose. Victory versus peace is somebody's going to war and winning and losing versus we've negotiated and we've circumvented all of that stuff. And we've just gone on to the part where everybody's okay. Or we have compromised. And so Minerva oversees that kind of uh, an intellectual and wisdom-oriented process of, sure, I could go out there and clang swords together and, and set your house on fire and we could just go at it with each other. Or we could sit down and talk about things and negotiate and compromise. Given the other potential... Um, tension of this week with Venus and Pluto and the nodes and the squares and the this and the that. It's kind of nice to have an archetype like this show up and go, whoa, 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 whoa. We can talk about this, you guys. We can actually find a level of compromise here. Like, what's going on? Now, let me be extremely clear. When I'm talking about human rights and trans rights are human rights, queer rights are human rights, indigenous rights are human rights, there's no compromise. <laughs> the compromise is shut it. <laughs> That's the compromise. So I think a Minerva is also helpful here in saying, hey, be smart about things, right? The goddess of wisdom. That's the first word that we put next to Minerva's name is wisdom. Um, but also justice, law, and victory. So potentially a positive archetype to show up in the midst of some of this funky stuff that's going on in our country and around the world. And, you know, I know that there are massive rebellions. There are massive uprisings happening all over the planet. Like let's, you know, don't get overwhelmed with that. Although it is an eight of swords week, <laughs> don't get overwhelmed with that. Um, but know that in the background, like we are in an era of turmoil and another way of saying that from a very neutral perspective is that we are in an area of, in an era of adjustment, we are in an era of mutability where the old thing is not serving us anymore. And it's like, you either have to change or you have to die. Like you have to, like you had, this system has to change and evolve and grow with the species, or it is proving itself to not be something that we are going to carry into the future. So I think that uh, we can tap into an archetype like Minerva to help us with that work. Um, she was a goddess of music, poetry, medicine, wisdom, commerce, weaving, and the crafts. Um, and so that is combining a lot of our Venus energy, a lot of our Mercury energy, a lot of our Gemini symbolism, um, all of that good stuff. Uh, she was often depicted as an owl, but she was also often depicted as a snake and even an olive tree. Um, usually depicted when as a human wearing armor, carrying a spear, highly revered, highly honored and highly respected. Uh, and some uh, Roman and Greek philosophers considered who, her to be quote unquote ideal and the plan for the universe personified. That's a trippy thing, especially when we think about the nodes and all of that stuff. I hope that's not get, I hope I'm not just like swirling a bunch of stuff for you right now, but that's sort of my job. Um, in my mind, I'm seeing that as like, you know, the nodes represent the concepts of destiny and fate and how we interact with those concepts. The plan of the universe, quote unquote, 
would certainly be another way of saying destiny or fate. And, um, and so, you know, we're being squared by that stuff or challenged, right? Remember at the, at the deep heart of an aspect, an astrological aspect, like a square, the universe is saying, Hey, here's a thing that's not working correctly, but it could, are you willing to lean in and facilitate that? Are you willing to do the work to take this thing from non-functional to functional? And so I don't know. I just think that that's a really cool archetype to have show up in the middle of all of this astrology because they're not going to be th happening at the same time every year. We're not going to have Venus and Pluto stuff happening necessarily next year when we have the Dies Natalis for the Temple of Minerva. Um, so just to have them in alignment this week, I think is really spicy and cool and difficult. Let's be real. But, but again, a moment of like, showing the potential. If we are willing to do the hard work, if we're willing to have the tough conversation, if we're willing to go into the painful space, we can move it through. We can potentially evolve it to something healthy and good, potentially. Okay, let's move on to June, Thursday, the 8th. I don't know why I said it like that. <laughs> Thursday, June 8th is the other way to say that. We have no astrology of note on this day, so let's scooch directly to the holy days. Uh, from our Greek friends and ancestors, we have the festival of Bendidia or Bendidia. Uh, this is a festival dedicated to the goddess Bendis, who is basically like a Thracian version of Artemis or Diana, literally. And they're like, no, 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 they're totally different. And they were totally different, but they do exactly the same stuff. <laughs> um, a huntress, uh, you know, a, a goddess of the wilderness, a goddess of the wilds, all of that good stuff. Um, but she also was like known for teaching people and dispensing wisdom. So there's, you know, that, that connection too with um, some of the other stuff that we think of with Artemis. But here is this. Um, there were torch races on horseback during this festival uh, from Plato's Republic. Quote, you haven't heard that there is to be a torchlit race this evening on horseback in honor of the goddess on horseback, said I. That's a new idea. Will they carry torches and pass them along to one another as they race with the horses? Or how do you mean? That's the way of it said Paul Marcus, and besides, there is to be a night festival, which will be worth seeing. So cool stuff. Um, there's some interesting details within this goddess uh, and her stuff. Not enough time to get into it, damn it. But check her out. She's cool. Bendis. Um, vaguely related to Kybel, even, or Sybil. Um, so, you know, you know how it goes, you know how it goes. Okay. Also on this day from our Catholic friends and ancestors, we have the feast of Corpus Christi. Uh, this is a celebration of the body, the blood and the soul of Jesus. So the three, the three parts of Jesus, weird, crazy. I know it's wild. It's, uh, a coincidence, I think is what we've been saying <laughs> several times this podcast. Um, and it's a celebration of that. Okay, cool, cute, lovely. But it's a celebration of that specifically as we close in on uh, summer solstice. And then if we look at folk traditions around Europe uh, where, this is where this is celebrated, what do we see? Um, there are wreaths and bouquets of flowers and herbs attached everywhere houses, doorways, and arches of green boughs that span the streets you know, greenery in the season of the green man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, and then these wreaths and these boughs are blessed. They're put up in the gardens. They're put up in the fields and pastures with a prayer for protection and blessing upon the growing crops uh, and the surging crops. So again, we have this energy of green and plants and nature um, and then a blessing and a protection moment that's happening here. I mean, come on, guys. Come on, guys. Uh, Poland, a carpet of live flowers about a, about a mile long 
And then a procession passes over it. So we're literally walking on a bed of flowers for this. Okay. 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 <laughs> what else is on this day? From our global friends and ancestors, we have World Ocean Day. Again, this is exactly what it sounds like. This is a day of awareness, acti uh, activity, um, action, um, and uh, and attention on um, the world's oceans. And, um, you know, what, one of the issues also side note, team Orca, team Orca. I don't think that comes as a surprise to anybody, but just so it's on the record team Orca. And if you don't know what I'm looking at or talking about, look up Orca knocking over ships because it's becoming a trend amongst the Orca. And most of us are, are supporting the Orca. In this. We're, we're on their side. Absolutely. Um, but yes, World Ocean Day, a day of awareness and um, effort and act, action on, on behalf of the oceans of the world. Great day to go worship the ocean too. But the best kind of worship for the ocean is go clean up a local waterway, go clean up a local beach, um, uh, go, go pick trash. Best possible thing you could do. All right. Also on this day from our Roman friends and ancestors, we have the Dies Natalis for the Temple of Sumanus. Uh, Sumanus uh, is kind of a weird dude. Uh, we don't know a whole lot about this deity, um, but they are uh, the god of nocturnal thunder in ancient Roman religion, as counterposed to Jupiter, the god of daytime thunder. Uh, as Wikipedia says, his precise nature was even unclear to Ovid. Look, so even homies back in the day were like, I'm not entirely certain what's going on with this. Um, possibly the greatest of the manes. Um, but again, to me, what I'm thinking about is thunder usually paired with lightning. And we already know that lightning is a thing with the twins, Gemini, Castor and Pollux. So something interesting there. Um, something interesting there. Not sure exactly what it is, but there's something interesting there. Okay. Also on this day, uh, from our Norwegian friends and ancestors, we have the festival or the feast day of Suniva. Suniva currently is depicted as a saint, but we know that everywhere there's a saint, there's usually a god, a pagan goddess or god buried directly beneath them. Um, patron saint of Norway, super cute, super lovely. But if we roll back, if we push deeply into the name Suniva, it is Sun or Sol, aka uh, a sun goddess. Um, and depicted as literally the sun personified in Germanic mythology. Uh, so, hello, there we go. As we're closing in on summer solstice, here we are having more and more of these light deities, solar deities showing up and doing a thing. And what is one of the things that is connected to this goddess? You'll love it. It is the Merseburg incantation, a.k.a. The horse cure. Bitch. <laughs> Come on. Get out of here. <laughs> Suna or Suniva uh, and her sisters uh, sing charms um, and heal a horse um, and, and heal a, a, the broken legs of a horse. I mean, come on. Okay, look. <laughs> I couldn't make it up if I wanted to. <laughs> it's pretty dialed in, you guys. It's pretty dialed in. All right, let's head on to Friday, June 9th. Okay, let's start off with the astrology for this day. We have something quite sweet, actually. We have Mercury in Taurus, sextile Neptune in Pisces at 27 degrees. This is honestly freaking lovely. Like, finally. <laughs> um. And not finally, I mean, there we do have some spicy astrology this month, but we also have a lot of nice astrology this month, which is cool after, 
you know, the last few months of eclipses and like blah, 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 blah. We still have Pluto camped out at zero degrees of Aquarius. It's about to tip back into um, Capricorn. That's going to be happening imminently. Um, but still, it's sort of in that spot. So anytime anything crosses over that threshold, it's like, you know, as I said a few weeks ago, it's like it's got to pay the toll to the troll that is Pluto. <laughs> Pluto, please don't come for me on that. I mean that with all love and respect. Okay. But anyways, today we have, or on this day, we have Mercury in Taurus hanging out with Neptune and Pisces, and it's very, very lovely. So first off, if the previous astrology of this week has stirred up some tough emotions and some tough energies between you and loved ones, this is a beautiful day for having some conversations around that where everybody hopefully is feeling much more loving towards each other. And so much more willing to have a tough conversation because in, at the end of it, we love each other. So let's figure it out kind of a thing. Um, it's really, really, really beautiful for that. Uh, I mean, there's really nothing else to say about it in terms of that. I just think it can really facilitate those conversations if they need to be had, this might be a great day to have them. You know, if you've said earlier in the week, hey, can I have some time to think about this? This is tough. Can I have some time to process it? This might be a day to hold yourself accountable to say, okay, let's come back to it on Friday because I think we'll both be in a better mood and more willing to have this conversation, um, you know, and vice versa, etc. Otherwise, this is an incredible day for reading poetry and writing poetry and, you know, enjoying the arts and sinking yourself into the arts. Um, as I said before, this is kind of the high season for, you know, street fairs and neighborhood stuff. Beautiful day, beautiful day for going and hanging out with your neighbors, going and hanging out with community members um, and in just enjoying each other and like letting the good vibes roll through. Um, great day for reading, great day for learning, great day for teaching. If there's something that you want to present, this is a wonderful time for doing that. Um, that's it. I honestly don't have much else to say. Oh, the other thing I could say is that the moon enters Pisces on this day. So we have that energy in the background too. Um, very, very briefly when we're hanging out with the moon in Pisces, <clears throat> um, we are similar to Aquarius supporting or otherwise restoring the legs, especially the ankles, and especially, especially the feet, uh, which are ruled by Pisces. Um, so a beautiful day for walking, all of that stuff. Uh, the only piece of, you know, warning or like something to keep in the back of your mind is that when we are experiencing Neptune transits, we can really leave the body. So if you want to do some astral projection or that kind of magic, this is a lovely day for that. Uh, be grounded, be safe in your magical practices and all that. But generally, um, it's beautiful for that. But you might need to leave a note for yourself to remember, oh, I need to drink some water. I need to have a snack. Um, let me make sure that I'm taking care of my body. Have I put my sunscreen on? Or did I just run out of the house in a sundress? You know, <laughs> Or like a frock of some sort. Um, so just remember that before you head out on your dreamy, beautiful adventures, um, take a moment to make sure that, oh, I've, I've brought a water bottle with me. I have a piece of fruit. I have a granola bar. I've got a snack of some kind, um, or the means of getting a snack of some kind. And I'm going to take care of myself as I drift through this fantasy adventure of a day. Okay. That's it. That's all I got for you on that. Um, so <clears throat> heading directly into the holy days of Friday, June 9th, we have, what was until this year referred to as the queen's birthday. It will now for the foreseeable future be referred to as the king's birthday. And isn't that an interesting thing? It doesn't matter when that monarch is actually born. Uh, their birthday is uh, celebrated on this day right here. As we are approaching summer solstice, as we are approaching the height of the sun's power, just randomly, right? Just randomly, uh, the monarchy picked this day. I don't know how they came up with it. Super wild. Who knows? Uh, you know, supposedly it has something to do with King George back in 1740s, but uh, you know, 
<laughs> a couple of people have lived since then and been uh, the monarch of, <laughs> of the kingdom or queendom. Um, and yeah, so interesting stuff. Um, but this is the day, the second Monday of June, generally speaking, but also around this time of year um, as we approach summer solstice. Interesting stuff. Okay. From our Norse friends and ancestors, we have Remembrance Day for Sigurd the Volsung. Not going to go in too hard on this, uh, but Sigurd is a legendary hero of Germanic legend who killed a dragon. We've had some St. George references this week as well, so there's another connection to that symbology. Um, also known in some Old Norse sources as Fafnir. Um, that's it. I will also say possibly he was inspired by one or more of the figures of the Frankish Merovinian dynasty. And if you're into Holy Grail stuff, if you're into René Le Chateau stuff, uh, the Merovinians are a, a family that you, that's a last name that you've heard. We're not going to get into it here, but just know that that there's a connection to that. If that's something you want to hunt down. Okay. From our Shinto friends and fans, ancestors, we have the Yotaka Matsuri Festival. Uh, this is a wild-ass festival that happens every year in Japan. Um, the Yaku Festival, sweaty, drunken, dangerous. Yes. <laughs> oh, where do I sign? <laughs> Massive lantern-covered floats intentionally crashed into one another in a contest of maneuvering and brute strength. When the sun goes down, the floats are lit up and paraded through the crowded streets of Tonami City. Festival goers enjoy food and a lot of booze. And afterwards, when the crews are finally drunk enough, the action begins. <laughs> Two at a time, the floats are pushed towards one another as fast as the crews can run. On the front are giant wooden poles similar to battering rams used to inflict as much damage as possible to the opposing team. The floats come crashing together with a loud bang, sending chunks of debris and people flying. After the initial crash, the crews jockey for position by trying to shove the enemy's float back as far as possible. Once one of the teams has been pushed back sufficiently, a winner is declared and the floats are dragged back to their starting positions to square off again. Uh, they collide three times. Three? Huh. Uh, and the crew with the most wins is declared the victor at the end of the night. After all the floats have faced each other, a grand champion is declared and the crews disperse to go party and be a menace in the neighborhood. <laughs> it's a wild night of sights and sounds and smells with more than a hint of danger in the air. Uh, thanks to japantravel.com for that write-up. I love that. Um, but yeah, great stuff. The Japanese, man, y'all know how to party for real, for real. Like, <laughs> like, you guys are really, really dialed in on this whole hedonism thing. And goddess bless, let me say that. Absolutely goddess bless, 100%. Um, our last holy day for this day comes from our Celtic slash Catholic friends and ancestors. This is uh, the Feast of St. Columba of Iona. Um, I'll be frank. I don't know. I I know that I put this in my notes initially because it falls on this day. But I can't find if there's anything super cool, any other like super wild coincidence uh, that that rolls in with this character. There might be, it might just be that they're here and I haven't found the connection yet. Maybe there isn't a connection. Uh, you know, me, I'm like, no, it's all connected guys for real, but you know, sometimes it isn't. Um, but anyways, Columba having a fancy day on this day. Super great. Okay. <laughs> so let's now, uh, roll it back and, um, go over the week's astrology just to catch you up again. Saturday, June 3rd at 8.41 p.m., we have our full moon, our full strawberry moon in Sagittarius, more or less kind of aspected really by nothing. But yeah, there's some wide aspects. Uh, patrons, you can check the chart uh, that I've put up with the notes. Uh, Sunday, June 4th, we have Mercury in Taurus conjunct Uranus at 20 degrees. Um June 5th, Monday, June 5th, we have the moon moving into Capricorn. We have Venus moving into Leo. And then we immediately have Venus in Leo 
opposing Pluto retrograde in Aquarius at zero degrees. Um, Tuesday, June 6th, we got nothing. Wednesday, June 7th, at four in the morning, we have our disseminating moon in Aquarius at one degree. Uh, Thursday, June 8th, we have Venus and Leo square uh, the north node slash south node in Taurus at one or two or three degrees, depending on what math you're utilizing. Um, Friday, June 9th, we have the moon moving into Pisces, and we also have Mercury and Taurus sextile Neptune in Pisces at 27 degrees. So that brings us to the end ish of the podcast. What are we working with this week with tarot? Um, I think that it is appropriate for us to hang out with either the eight of swords or the nine of swords. I wrote down the nine of swords initially in my notes. I'm kind of leaning more towards the eight of swords now. I just posted a giant piece on the Eight of Swords. This was up a year ago for patrons. It's now available to everybody. Uh, you can just go to my website. Again, um, go to the Beltane page, scroll down, and you'll find the link uh, for this giant piece on the Eight of Swords. Um, but the Eight of Swords really talks about um, the, the culmination of the work that we've been doing throughout spring and how, in this moment... It, whether things have panned out or not panned out, the whole process might be feeling a little overwhelming. Also, that it, as this is playing out, we might be finding our crew that we are going to roll through summer with. That might be gelling for us a little bit here. Um, and that crew might be literal people in our life. It might be archetypes that we're choosing to work with in this coming season. Um, it might be movements that we're thinking about joining or lending our forces to, et cetera, et cetera. But either way, all of that stuff might be feeling a little overwhelming right now. And we're kind of like, oh man, what have I gotten myself into? What did I say I was going to do? Oh, geez. So go read that piece. Go check it out. Um, and all at the same time, the TLDR of that is I, I, I sort of encourage letting yourself sit in a moment of feeling a little overwhelmed. Um, I know that that's not a super comfortable feeling really for probably anybody, or at least most people, it's not a super comfy feeling. Uh, and that's legit. Um, but to feel overwhelmed uh, sometimes can give us the gift of, I have to make a decision. I can't let all of these pokers sit in the fire. I can't possibly raise all of the things that I have planted seeds for this year. There's too much going on. Oh my gosh. And that is ultimately going to set us up for making the decisions that we have to make when we step into summer around what am I going to foster and what am I going to let go and maybe come back to next year in the next cycle. We'll talk more about that process as we get closer to Litha and summer solstice, but that is some of the work that we need to be, you know, approaching as we end Beltane and we end uh, uh, summer, or excuse me, end spring. Okay. For our witchcraft this week, um, leaving offerings for local spirits, very, very potent, 100%. Um, and you can do that in all different kinds of ways. You can be leaving offerings for the local spirits of your actual house, blessing your doorways and your thresholds and things like that. Um, you might be moving out to your neighborhood. You might do some research about the people that lived where you live before you and before people who look like you. Um, unless you were the first people there, and you might be listening to this, um, and thinking about the the energies and the entities that are native to the space where you are and just leaving a, a gift for them. And even if you can't find information or maybe you don't have time to do that research, although, as I mentioned before, this is a great week for doing magical research, um, you know, just saying, hey, I know you're here. I don't know your name. I don't know what you look like, but I know that you exist. Hi, here's, here's a cookie. Here's some fresh water. Here's a stick of incense. Thank you. Let, let's go forth. 
even that is some type of a recognition. I think it's better than nothing. Very appropriate right now. Uh, great week for burning stuff and clearing space and beginning that process of clearing space as we approach uh, the final weeks and days of summer of, of spring and belting season and getting ready for summer solstice. So burning stuff and clearing space, very appropriate. Protection magic, very appropriate right now. Um, especially and harvesting herbs as well that help in reduction and elimination magic. And also our protection magic can be pointed in the direction of reduction and elimination. So when our moon is waxing, as we've talked about many times, um, we want to increase, we want to embiggen. Uh, when our moon is waning, we want to reduce or eliminate or shrink or or, or, you know, power down our stuff. So when it comes to things like protection magic, what we're saying is I want less harm in my world. I want less things to protect against. I want less, less enemies, less problems, less bad. Um, and we certainly could use some of that on planet earth right now. My goodness. Um, our journaling prompts for this week, I didn't write anything. I wrote some things and then I took it out. And so what I, what I encourage is this is a great a week astrologically for magical reading, magical research, magical writing. Perhaps that it's, it's self-study, right? Self-guided study this week. <laughs> Whatever magical work is coming up for you based on all this stuff that I just talked about, let that be your journaling work this week. Um, and that's going to be very subjective to each and every one of you. And that's appropriate, I think, for our process right now. Um, if you want some guidance on that, on the bigger level, I think that the Venus opposing Pluto thing is maybe our spiciest astrology of the whole week. Um, so diplomacy versus shadowy relationship drama, right? That might be something to journal on. Where do I prefer to let things stay unhealthy and unspoken for the sake of di diplomacy versus where am I willing to kind of have things not be comfortable in a pursuit of having things be healthy in my relationship world? What's that look like for me? Um, but again, I think that more appropriate is just self-guided study this week, whatever magical, mystical, spiritual, philosophical readings and writings you would like to sink into and engage in uh, that's your appropriate journaling stuff. All right. My witches, my heathens, my pagans, thank you for joining me. I told you we were going in on it this week. It's been a long one. So thanks for sticking it out with me this whole time. Uh, drink some water. It's getting hot out there for those of us in the Northern hemisphere. Um, take care of your unhoused neighbors as well. Um, uh, you know, again, it's getting hot outside um, so check in on your unhoused neighbors and make sure that they've got food and water. If you're running to the grocery store, maybe grab an extra couple bottles of water or what have you, if your economy, um, can handle that. And if it can't, you know, do what you can. Um, but that's it, my friends. I hope you're having a beautiful time out there. I hope this moon, this beautiful full moon above is illuminating and enlightening. I hope it is expansive and I hope that you can come into a place of allowing in some hope and some uh, optimism and some expansive thinking about your circumstances and the world and our species' fate. Blessed be.